This talk regards critical care ultrasound for the evaluation of deep venous thrombosis. A few key background statistics. In the United States, there's an estimated incidence of 2 million diagnoses of deep venous thrombosis per year, about 50,000 of which result in death. 90% of pulmonary emboli, which are the most common cause of death from deep venous thrombosis, come from proximal deep venous thrombosis, those proximal to the knee. About half of all proximal DVTs will become pulmonary emboli. About 30% of calf DVTs or distal DVTs will ultimately propagate to become proximal and therefore increased in terms of risk of pulmonary embolus. We're all familiar with the Verhoff's triad of endothelial injury, circulatory stasis, and hypercoagulant state as being the leading risk factors leading to thrombosis. Commonly, we hear about signs and symptoms of deep venous thrombosis, such as erythema, Homan sign, and so forth. We need to keep in mind that there is a low specificity and sensitivity of the clinical examination for identifying deep venous thrombosis properly. Risk factor analysis is important in terms of pretest probability, but we should not rely on signs and symptoms of deep venous thrombosis to rule in or rule out DVT. There are pretest uh, predictors, uh, pretest probability scales such as the modified Wells criteria, where certain points are given for certain risk factors, and the higher the number of points, the higher the probability of deep venous thrombosis is. And we use these clinically. We also use certain laboratory tests such as the D-dimer, but none of these are standalone tests especially in the population of emergency room patients or ICU patients. D-dimer in and of itself has poor positive predictive value, but it does have a good negative predictive value. The objective assessment of deep venous thrombosis is as follows. Venography is considered the gold or the reference standard for the diagnosis of DVT. However, this is invasive, expensive, and fairly uncommon. Also, we can use impedance plethysmography, but this is only reliable in detecting proximal occlusive thrombi and compression ultrasonography, which is going to be the focus of our discussion today, has a high sensitivity and specificity of proximal DVT, both of the occlusive and non-occlusive nature. And this is a non-invasive test that's relatively inexpensive. The following diagnostic strategy is one which we can undertake. First step is to develop a pretest probability through use of such types of scales as the Wells score. You can have a moderate or high probability pretest, then we perform compression ultrasound. If there's a low prob probability, then we go on to step two and get a D-dimer. If that D-dimer is very low and we have a low pretest probability, then essentially we stop there. If we have a higher or elevated D-dimer, even if a low probability well score, then sometimes we use our clinical judgment and move on to compression ultrasonography. Mm. If we have a low probability and a positive D-dimer, compression ultrasound can be very easily and safely done. If the ultrasound is negative, but the D-dimer is elevated, often we repeat the ultrasound in one week. The ability to rule in or rule out a deep venous thrombosis at the bedside is a very powerful tool in the ICU and can really change the management of our patients in real time. The potential uses we have for compression ultrasonography in the critical care setting are to evaluate lower extremity swelling or pain, to add evidence for or against pulmonary embolism in patients who have uh, suspicion for PE and perhaps have a contraindication for CT scan or are too unstable to go to the CT scanner. 
and also for use during a code situation of PEA arrest as part of the assessment for reversible causes. Here's a clinical scenario. A patient who's clinically unstable has the following echo. It shows right ventricular enlargement and apical hyperkinesis with right ventricular free wall hypokinesis or akinesis, which we know as McConnell sign. Keep in mind the normal RV to LV ratio is less than one. And here is the McConnell sign. Some reports say that McConnell sign has a fairly, fairly high sensitivity and specificity for, for PE, but we also need to keep in mind that these reports did not include patients with right ventricular infarct in their analysis, and that can mimic this appearance. But moving on, if this patient had that clinical picture of hemodynamic instability acutely and an echo that showed right ventricular enlargement and strain, then the next step could be to move down to the femoral veins and perform compression ultrasonography. This image of the same patient having downward compression on the right femoral vein showing lack of coaptation and lack of the front wall touching the back wall of the vein. When this scenario is found, then it can impact your decision and your management in real time. Just a reminder about lower extremity vascular anatomy. In the femoral triangle, we think of the navel from lateral to medial, nerve, artery, vein, empty space, and lymph node. Here we will usually see the common femoral vein deep and medial to the femoral artery. Approximately, we often see the greater saphenous vein coming in medially into the common femoral vein. And this is a common area of deep vein thrombosis as it's an area of higher turbulence due to bifurcation. So this is an important area to visualize in our evaluation. In the mid-thigh, typically the artery has divided into two, and the superficial femoral vein, which is a misnomer as it's not considered a superficial vein, it is a deep vein, is seen medial to the two arteries. In the lower extremity, in the popliteal area, we see as the common femoral and superficial femoral vein dive through the adductor canal, coming out superiorly with the popliteal vein located superficial to the artery in the popliteal fossa. Sometimes we say that this is the pop on top, or the, pop, the popliteal vein on top of the artery. Which probe we select is important. Keep in mind that the structures that we'll be visualizing in most of our patients are very superficial, less than six centimeters below the surface. So we would choose the vascular probe or the linear high frequency probe. This will give us a low penetration and good discrimination in detail of the tissue layers. The key probe positions which we focus on in bedside point of care ultrasound for DVT are two, the proximal femoral triangle and also the popliteal fossa. Typically, when you see an ultrasound technologist performing a DVT ultrasound examination, you'll see them marching down the entire length of the femoral vein. So why two-point compression? When you see an ultrasound technologist from the radiology department perform evaluations for DVTs, you'll see them marching down the entire length of the femoral vein, and typically this takes upwards of half an hour. In the ICU, not only do we not have the time to do this, but it's also the evidence does not support um, needing to do this. For instance, in a large case series of greater than 1,000 patients who are suspected of having a DVT, 
These patients all went, underwent venography, and there were no cases where a proximal DVT was seen on venography that did not involve at least the popliteal or the femoral triangle. So, an ultrasound of the clot in the popliteal vein or the common femoral vein should identify all significant proximal DVTs. There were no DVTs in this study for more than a thousand patients who had an isolated DVT in the mid back. The key technique we will focus on in the ICU is compression. There are advanced techniques such as augmentation, color Doppler flow, and respiratory variation, which we will comment upon, but none of these are standalone tests. We will discuss the simplified two-point compression technique, again supported by evidence such as in the October 2008 JAMA article stating that two-point technique is as effective for detecting DVT as the whole leg method. There are two essential questions for focused DVT imaging. One, does the femoral vein fully compress? And two, does the popliteal vein fully compress? For compression, we choose, again, the high-frequency linear probe, and we place this perpendicular to the skin over the veins in question, pressing perpendicularly downward with an even force. Some tips. We always include the common femoral vein. We try to include where the greater saphenous vein joins the common femoral vein, if it can be found. We always include the popliteal fossa. Positioning is very important. Often we need to frog leg for proximal views as we would for our central line placement in the femoral vein. And for the popliteal space, if possible, um, for the patient to dangle their leg or prone them, we do that, but in most of our patients, this is not possible. So we need to have the legs supported by an external force such as another assistant holding up the leg or an arm holding up the leg. We do not want the probe to be what is holding up the leg as this will actually compress the vein and you will not be able to see the structures you need to visualize. You want to apply pressure evenly with the probe perpendicular to the skin. If you are pressing too hard on one side versus the other, you may inadvertently create an impression of a vein that's not collapsing. And often we scan the unaffected extremity for comparison if there's any question. If the veins do not fully compress, we have to think DVT. Here's some examples. This is a normal left common femoral vein. You can see the front wall and the, and the back wall completely collapse or touch during compression. There's a popliteal vein. The popliteal vein is on top, and during downward compression, you will see that that vein is not closing. So even though you cannot necessarily appreciate something in the lumen, the implication of the vein not collapsing is that there is something that is a space-occupying structure, such as a clot. There's a common femoral vein on the right, with abnormal compression, and you, here you can appreciate the opacity. Oftentimes acute thrombi appear anechoic or black, whereas chronic thrombi are more echogenic, but this is not always the case. Common femoral vein on the right, abnormal compression, again with an interluminal opacity appreciated. In longitudinal view, we have a common femoral vein compression. compression. The, long, the vein is inferior here, and this is the artery. And during compression, you will appreciate that the vein is not fully collapsing. Popliteal, here we have the popliteal vein and the popliteal artery. And during compression, there is some collapse, but not full. So this is probably a non-inclusive popliteal vein. Augmentation is a supplementary technique to compression, but not, again, a standalone technique. 
What we do here is we're evaluating for unobstructed venous flow distal to the probe. In other words, no distal DVT. What we do is we place the probe uh, over the vein in question and we center the pulse wave Doppler gate in the middle of the vein. Then we squeeze the calf distal to the probe, which will push blood flow through the vein as it returns to the heart, and we would note changes in flow. Normally we would have a rapid temporary increase in venous flow, but if there is some a deep venous thrombosis, many times we will notice diminished or no increase in flow during augmentation. This is a power Doppler example. Power Doppler is non-directional Doppler, which, to, in, which um, picks up lower flow states. And what you see here is with the squeeze of the calf and the power Doppler centered over the proximal vessel, that there should be increased flow through the vein. And in this case, you can see that there is something, there is flow, it's a non-occlusive DVT, but there is a, um, an area, a filling defect, which would imply that there's a clot. Another example with uh, pulse wave Doppler, here we have the gate in the middle of the left femoral vein, and you can see the point at which the squeeze was applied to the calf. You can see the rapid increase in the flow. So even if there is some clot, this implies that there's not a fully occlusive clot, but you cannot say for sure that there's not some clot without compression. Here's another example. How do we use color Doppler? Well, this is again an advanced technique which we assess flow in the vein. It is not a standalone test. Remember that with color Doppler, you will not see a color Doppler signal when there's flow perpendicular to the, to the uh, probe. So what we need to do is align the color Doppler box parallel to the vessel walls when we're in longitudinal or perpendicular to the vessel walls and then we will want to lean the probe either toward or away from the head so that we have an angle where the flow is either coming towards the probe or away from the probe so that we can get a color signal. If you need to, you can use the gain button to increase mm -hmm. color gain. Or you can use power Doppler if you have a lower flow state and you're not trying to uh, appreciate directionality. Here we have an artery with flow, but we have no flow within the vein. And this is an inclusive common femoral vein plot. Here we have an artery in the vein. This is normal flow. Here we probably recommend turning up the gain just a, a bit so that this one area of dropout down here is not misinterpreted as a clot. But again, you would want to pair color flow with compression. left popliteal vein. We have compression and we have power flow paired here. And we can find that there's a non-occlusive popliteal DVT. We do have some flow, but we have a, a opacity here that is not allowing for compression. So pairing these two together gives you more information. Here's color flow across the popliteal vein. And this is an occlusive popliteal DVT, as it appears. Respiratory variation is not used very often. It is an advanced technique which will essentially tell you whether there's a clot proximal to the vein under evaluation. So if there's a clot in the iliac vein or the inferior vein cava even, then you wouldn't expect to see respiratory variation of flow with changes in intrathoracic pressure in the veins that are more distal to that clot. Again, this is not used that often. There are many pitfalls to two-point compression ultrasonography for evaluation of DVTs. Again, as stated before, epigenicity is not something you can hang your hat on. You can't know just because you see or don't see a clot how old it is or whether it's there. Slow-flowing blood can also appear epigenic, like smoke, but again, slow-flowing blood would be fully compressible. In the popliteal fossa, it's very easy to get hung up 
one side of the probe or the other on one of the hamstring tendons. Here it is helpful to have a linear probe with a smaller footprint if possible, like the L25. If you push too hard, and with the initial evaluation, you may not be able to find the vein to begin with. For instance, if you're holding the leg up with the probe in the popliteal space, you may not be able to find the popliteal vein. So you have to have a very light touch. Morbidly obese patients, sometimes their veins are more than six centimeters down, so that high frequency probe with a six centimeter depth capacity is not adequate. And there are lookalikes. Some of the lookalikes that are commonly mistaken for DDTs are lymph nodes. Remember that in the femoral triangle we have navel, nerve, artery, vein, empty space, and lymph node. Lymph nodes will appear like a round structure with a center of echogenicity. Many people will mistake this for a DDT. But remember, veins are longitudinal structures. When you catch them in cross-section, they're round. When you see them longitudinally, they're, they are linear. Lymph nodes are circular structures. So if you catch them in cross-section, they're round. But if you turn longitudinally, they're still round. So if you have any question about whether you're looking at a lymph node or a vessel, turn the probe 90 degrees from cross-section to longitudinal and see if the structure that you're looking at becomes longitudinal or stays circular. Here's an example. The question is, what is this structure here? Is this a vein with a clot in it? Is this a vein with a clot in it? And what about here? So what it ends up seeing is that the, this is a superficial vessel and these are lymph nodes. And actually the deeper vessels are further down here need to increase the depth to be able to appreciate those. Here's another example. Artery, vein, lymph node. Artery, vein, lymph node. So if you turn the probe 90 degrees, you'll see the vein and arteries splay out longitudinally, but the lymph node will still appear circular. This is a baker's cyst at the popliteal space. What you have here is no flow and a, and a shape that kind of hugs the bone right here. Pseudoaneurysms, groin hematomas, pelvic lymphadenopathy that are creating external compression of vessels, all can make two-point compression uh, somewhat challenging. We want to always assess the positioning, color, pulse wave Doppler to further delineate exactly what you're looking at if there's any question. And obviously, if there's any question um, at all, we can obtain a formal ultrasound. So the question now is, should we be doing this? Can we be doing this? Well, yes, there are many studies that show that two-point evaluation for DDT of lower extremity has been validated and is accurate. Two-point evaluation is well accepted, actually, in the emergency room as an effective decision-making tool. But we use it in conjunction with clinical judgment and pretest probability. A few of the key studies. This is a study by Blavis. A prospective comparison of duplex ultrasonography by radiology with bedside two-point compression by ICU or ED doctors, and there was a 98% correlation between the two studies. However, the mean scan time of the ICU and emergency physician doctors was four minutes, which is much, much reduced over the radiology scan time and turnaround time. And the comment to this study is the bedside exam was accurate, but augmentation they did find was not an accurate test in isolation. Another study did a prospective evaluation of two-point compression with holding anticoagulation if the two-point compression was normal. And the question was, if we make clinical decisions based on the results of two-point compression, are the outcomes for the patient in the long term any different? And what they found was about a 0.7% complication rate 
during the follow-up period using the clinical algorithm of pretest probability and two-point compression. And this was essentially the same complication rate seen with formal radiology. And the comment here was that it's safe to defer anticoagulation based on two-point compression when the two-point compression ultrasound is normal. Another study in 2004 looked at resident-performed compression ultrasonography for DVT. Here was a prospective study, patients presenting with signs or symptoms of proximal lower extremity DVT. Each patient both got a vascular and Department of Radiology study. And the results showed that there were eight residents who had limited ultrasound experience, no prior experience with DVT ultrasound, and they looked at 72 patients. The average scan time here was 12 minutes, with the sensitivity and specificity that were very high. For the clinical assessment of DVT, we have to think about sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity, when used with risk stratification, which includes D-dimer testing and bedside ultrasound, bedside ultrasound is sensitive enough to exclude DVT when the ultrasound is normal. And when used with D-dimer testing, bedside ultrasound is also specific enough to diagnose DVT and to begin treatment when the test demonstrates clot. A few more sample images. Here is ephemeral DVT. Right here, all of these are compression images. This is a still image that shows the artery in the vein. This is normal. Longitudinal view. We have the vein with what appears to be a opacity in the lumen. And here we have a popliteal vein that fully compresses. Another example. This is a femoral vein. Femoral vein being the one with the calipers on it and showing the lack of full compression with downward force implying that there's a space-occupying lesion or a DVT. And here we have a still image of a popliteal vein and artery with an apparent opacity in the popliteal vein. This is the left femoral vein, which is normal. And here we have a right femoral vein which has a clot. Longitudinal view. It would be best to angle this box so it was parallel to the walls, but here the absent flow in um, the situation of DVT in the vein. This is a femoral vein. This isn't a good use of real estate on this image. You should decrease the depth to focus on the vessels in question. But what we're seeing here is actually what looks falsely like a DVT. It looks like the walls are not fully coming together. But in actuality, this is uneven compression, more compression on one side of the curve than the other, creating this false positive. A few samples. A 42-year-old woman with breast cancer and a porta calf who presented with dyspnea, and this is her internal jugular vein. And with gentle compression, there looked to be something that was not allowing full compression. When the collar was placed, we see some flow, so non occlusive deep venous thrombosis of an internal jugular vein. So conclusions, the key technique that we need to get um, practiced in and get good at is compression. The advanced techniques such as augmentation, color doppler, and respiratory variation are additive but are not standalone.